I don't think there's one zero trust product out there. I just want to be clear here for those companies that say, oh, we got your zero trust solution here. No, it, it is a philosophy uh, to achieve those goals and it has to be built in uh, to the overarching infrastructure itself. The infrastructure should defend itself, basically. Absolutely, absolutely. And now, now kind of a, a bookend, right? We talked about lateral movement um, and, and there was one question that I'm gonna throw in here as well. Um, you know, does zero trust, uh, like what's the, the most obvious way zero trust helps us solve some of these lateral movement issues you guys were talking about? Um, is, is there one example that comes to mind, Tom or Fred? Yeah, I mean, just micro segmentation, network segmentation and behavioral anomaly detection uh, would allow you to contain a threat that's uh, misusing yeah. a protocol or uh, moving now here, on landscape. Here's an interesting riff on this, and, and maybe, Fred, this is for you as a CISO. Um, what's sort of the, um, what's your take on privacy and user privacy? If you're scanning drives, um, you know, is, is there any concern there or is that, hey, you're an employee, uh, everything's fair game and we're going to look for keywords or anything that's exploitable. Is that is that problem out there today or is that solved? Uh, yeah, that problem's out there. Uh, there, there, are, there are definitely things, the ways and means to look for what you're describing. Uh, I, I refer to this as a radius of dispersion. Okay, in this particular thing, there's model for it and so on. But the notion that that people do this, uh, absolutely. Um, but it is a requirement, and one of the challenges that we have is, you know, what was once known as acceptable use uh, has also changed because you're working at home, right? But we try to be very careful about how we define what acceptable use means uh, from your home infrastructure. But one of the great things about having an endpoint detection response, um, you know, as a fundamental component of zero trust is we can also look at policy directly for the device in this particular case, and we entitle accordingly, right? So in this particular case, if you wanted to suggest that you could go see this particular service and utilize this and authenticate through this particular service, vis-a-vis -vis SAML or something like this, the brokered uh, policy to help you make sure you're doing that in a secure way uh, with the controls implemented on said, you know, uh, endpoint is really a critical component. So we can both be able to prevent a lot of the challenges people find themselves in, but also keep the boundary of what that looks like to where we think about work assets and work utilization. Yeah, very fair. So it's it sounds like it's um, it's uh, all solvable with the right policy set, and and that makes perfect sense to me. I mean, Greg, I mean that's a loaded question because you can't achieve privacy without cybersecurity. And so right. for those people, oh, they have privacy from Fred. We have, but they don't have privacy from hacker X, country Y, and their ex spouse who's on their device uh, in the absence of Fred. You're you're right, and I I think this is the the great quandary, right? Uh, you can't have it both ways, and um, that that I think where we all know we need to be is on the side of privacy and defense, uh, and you know the the segmentation of work and personal data is going to be an interesting topic. It's a topic for another day. It is partly solved, I think, from where we sit in in device management. We can partition devices, for instance, but. But yeah, I mean that that leaves the user on that personal partition on their own, right? And and so they should be mindful of that. That they the best practices that they should have need to apply. So so that being said, so look, we have about uh, seven or so minutes, and and I want to um, really focus on sort of advice uh, and and really zero in on you know what what should a customer or an MSP be looking at. Uh, whenever they are um, evaluating their vendors. So a lot of what you guys discussed today is internal best practices. So at Jump Cloud, at VMware, we are all using best practices for DevOpsSec and code concurrency and you know scanning and hardening our code. But but how how do you translate that to somebody who's trying to buy? Like how do they buy with confidence? What is there is there something that you guys could share that would be your advice here? So, so Tom, maybe um, sure. yeah. where, where should they focus and, and who? And let's just take this at a high level. Um, so a lot of it has to do with governance and rigor. Um, so do they have a CISO? And if so, is that CISO reporting to the CEO? Yeah. Can that CISO veto or say no to CIO decisions? 
in the same construct? Do they conduct regular threat hunting uh, with the assumption of compromise? And, and are they, do they have aspirations or a program to achieve zero trust someday in place? I think those three very high level uh, questions can give you a sense of the culture of security that exists in that organization, which is an imperative. Yeah, now that makes sense. Fred, are there any particular keywords you look for if you were putting your buyer hat on uh, to, to your vendor? Uh, we spend a lot of time as a vendor, right? We spend a lot of time both making sure we can communicate what we're doing effectively, and as a buyer, in the same, we re we expect the same. And so that level of diligence around whether you're using a you know gate questionnaires, VSAs, things like this, are fundamental blocks. Stumble over these things. We don't need to get into whether or not you have compliance and audit capability. There, it's not a mindset. Um, and we we do spend the time. We are diligent about that from an interview perspective or conversations or um, you know, as a particular vendor case, there was one where we also looked at a number of different social media occurrences to make a decision around you know a vendor as well. Everything is in play here. Um, the risk is too great not to to do otherwise. So you know characterize that not just for the third party risk, but for the nth party risk, which is who else did they do business with and and why and how. So where, um, as as our vendors can tell you, there is a there is a bit of a filter and a pretty rigorous filter to go through. Um, to Tom's point, um, a lot of that rigor is around governance, and if you have it, great. Um, if you're on the upswing to get there, then we'll continue to move on. Fair enough, makes sense. So we've talked about this, I think, already to some degree, but but sort of my my last real question here is, you know, are there any uh, concerns uh, in the future? Like how, how do the wheels come off the wagon, right? I think let's paint it in stark uh, views. Like if we don't do X, we're done, um, you know, or, or do you guys feel like we're on the right trajectory? And that's really not the question to ask. So, so Tom, I mean, I, I this is a tough one. It's, but um, yeah. I want to bring the, to the audience's attention a very interesting shift in, in the legal world and beyond the privacy laws that are very important. Um, there's a shift now where you're seeing shareholder suits and, and class action suits because lack of cybersecurity is being viewed as a safety issue and a duty of loyalty issue. And what do I mean by that? The former chief justice of the Delaware Supreme Court, who is the court that basically controls 98% of corporate uh, in corporations, for that matter, said recently, it's not about a good faith in anything but a duty of loyalty. And a business has a duty of loyalty to ensure a secure and safe experience for any customer in their environment. And I think that's game changing. And you're gonna see much more litigation uh, and, and much more uh, pressure coming from lawsuits against organizations that attested to being secure, but then they were breached and then therein all their customers were breached as a result. Um, when it comes to countries and, and international norms, and I'll be quick, uh, next week is a big week. Uh, you got 30 countries that of significance that are gonna agree on how they're going to disrupt and pacify the dark web economy of scale and how they're gonna operate with one another to create norms on when they're gonna involve their militaries. Uh, to go after actors who target critical infrastructures. That's amazing. And is it is it sort of a, a NATO thing or is it more bilateral, Tom? I know that's a conversation for another day, but do you feel more good? About NATO countries. Uh, it includes the Quad, if you're familiar with the Quad, uh, which is Japan, India, uh, Australia, and the US, and it includes some other countries of significance like Singapore. Got it. So, uh, so that's something we should be following. I'm, I'm cautiously uh, excited about uh, what comes out of that. Uh, good, bad, or indifferent, of course. So, so Fred, um, you know, uh, your your final thoughts here on uh, any concerns or focus areas uh, that um, you know need to be observed here in the coming uh, months and years. I think there's an awful lot that we can do uh, in private enterprise. Right. Uh, you know, there's an old saying that, you know, every uh, every Marine is a rifleman. Well, every company you know, has the ability to exert their own security influence on their own intellectual property, on their IP space, on their methods of building software and their vendors that supply them. 
and there needs to be a, there's a good buddy of mine uh, Chris Cleary who's uh, CEO of the Navy at the moment we talk about this notion of a militia and the concept of how private and public uh, have to fuse together if we're going to be successful there's an awful lot of that work that can be done individually and we're certainly going to carry the standard in the process yeah yeah, and I, I believe everybody ultimately is going to band together here. Uh, we, we have to. It's it's sort of sink or swim. So uh, I'm personally hopeful. Uh, I I would love to see in the future that some of these attackers uh, sort of get boxed in. I know that's easier said than done, uh, but um, I'll be cautiously optimistic. Uh, but uh, you know, we'll see. Maybe we have this uh, discussion in another year uh, and and see what's changed but uh for now you know i think this this has been um really good i think in terms of getting sort of the insider view out on the table and, and what to be concerned about um i know that uh we've gone over a little bit on time so i'll wrap it up here um and uh, for those of you who may have additional questions you can you know follow up with the jump cloud team and we'll make sure they get answered for you um but in lieu of that um, I want to thank uh, Tom and Fred for spending time with us. I, I think this has been invaluable uh, and fun for me. Uh, you guys are uh, so knowledgeable and, and great to talk with. Uh, and appreciate the time and the perspective you guys have provided us today. Um, so thanks again, guys. Um, it's been fun. Uh, and uh, we'll, we'll sort of end it here and uh, you know, convene on another day. Please subscribe and check out more content from us.